Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper. If you haven't figured out from the scripture readings, uh, we've been going through a sermon series called The Church Challenge, and we're looking at uh, a, gaining a deeper understanding uh, of what we do when we worship and increasing our, our practice uh, of what we worship. And so today we're looking at the Lord's Supper. Why do we do the Lord's Supper? Um, <laughs> there's a book called Adventures in Churchland. I don't know if too many people in here have read it, but it's by a guy named Dan Kimball. And Dan is now a pretty famous Christian pastor, but uh, at one point in his life, he was not a Christian, had very little experience with Christianity. And so he writes about some of his adventures in this book. And it's you know slightly uh, almost irreverent for those of us who, who value the Lord's Supper so much, but it's helpful for us to gain sort of a, a, a newbie's eyes uh, because sometimes I, th I think we don't realize how uh, foreign some of the things we do in worship are, how uh, confusing they can be. And so when, when he kicks off the book, uh, Dan tells a story about how he and his friend Randy, uh, they were getting curious about Christianity. They wanted to know more. And so they tried to pick up the Bible and reading, read it and that was way too confusing. And so they were like, all right, we're gonna need some help here. So they decided to go to a church, and in the book, it, the way they describe this church, it actually sounds very Lutheran, which is kind of funny, but um, when they, they, they go into this church and they're kind of observing worship as it unfolds, they, they see the, the guy up front in the robes, and they're like, what's with the robes? It's kind of weird, you know? Nobody wears a robe unless you're wearing your bathrobe around the house type of deal. Um, and as it comes to communion, and they see him, you know, holding up the goblet, as, as they call it. And uh, they're like, is he talking to it? Is he talking about it? What is he doing? And they're in one of like these situations, right? Where they're like in the really tightly packed pews, you know? And so they, they soon realize as people are going up to communion that like there are people on either side of them. They can't escape, you know? <laughs> uh, and if I don't like move... People can't get by, so they realize they have to go up, right? And so they, they go up uh, to communion, and it's one of those deals where they're kneeling down front, and they're like, well, at least I can see what's going on better here, you know? And um, they see people taking like a little wafer and, and dipping it in the goblet and passing it down, and they're like, that's weird, but okay. And uh, people are saying something to each other, and, and Dan doesn't quite get what's being said, uh, so he, he gets it from the person next to him. I mean, you know, he takes, he passes it along to his friend Randy. And, and Randy's got like a church member on his other side. And so he knows that she's like expecting him to say something as he passes it to her, but he has no idea what. And so he just takes a stab and he's like, the cup of wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it causes all of them to laugh and like it cause a big scene and they, they have to leave. But I, I thought it was funny just go... You know, like, that was really someone's first experience with the Lord's Supper. Like, it really is kind of a, a strange foreign thing. And so, why do we do it? Uh, why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper in worship? And so, for today, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to see what it teaches us about the Lord's Supper. Um, there are actually three kind of major texts in God's Word uh, that are talking about the Lord's Supper. Three of them are written by the, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's their eyewitness accounts that they've recorded for us to, to know. But Paul's text here in 1 Corinthians 11 is kind of a different nature. It's a, more of an instructional text. He's writing to the Corinthians because he's kind of heard what's going on in their church, the church in Corinth. And uh, he writes about a lot of things, but in chapter 11, he starts to write about worship. And when he gets to verse 17, the Lord's Supper. And, uh, you know, he starts off with kind of a sting, right? Uh, you know, 17 and 19 here. I have no praise for you as I instruct you in the following matter. Snap, it's going to be one of those nervous services. Everyone bail, you know. <laughs> We're in trouble. Um, but he says, when you gather, it results in more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you gather as a church, you split up into opposing groups. I believe some of what I hear, uh, and, and I picture this almost you know, with sarcastic wit, factions have to exist in order to make it clear who the genuine believers among you are. Um, 
You know, Paul here, what he's talking about is that there should not be divisions in the church. There should not be groups of people who are openly opposed to one another. Uh, Some translations here say like there shouldn't be factions, which makes me think of like the new Divergent movie, right? Uh, You know, how these different factions in society and they live life really differently and they separate themselves. They're even kind of openly hostile to one another at times. That shouldn't happen in the church. Uh, Instead, what Paul is saying is we should be unified uh, as the body of believers in this place, as as the congregation of people who follow Jesus, uh, that we should be unified. Um, We we should be tight (laughs) with one another. You know, I I remember growing up uh, in youth group, there were some divisions, right? Maybe you experienced the same thing. Uh, or experienced it somewhere else in school or your workplace, how certain people hang out with others and don't want to hang out with, with the uncool people. Now, I was on the cool side, so everything was good, but some of you may have been the uncool side. Um, but in the church, we shouldn't have you know, divisions uh, you know, based on, on wealth or, or race or age or you know, people who saw the black and, and blue dress versus the white and gold dress, uh, the wrong people. Um, We should be unified. When a body and its systems and its organs begin to fight against itself, we would describe that as a very serious and life-threatening illness. Uh, And so in our body of believers, we desire to be healthy and to be unified toward the same goals, right? Okay, so that's 17 and 19. And if we move on here in 2022, we learn more. Paul says, when you gather in the same place, You can't possibly be eating the Lord's Supper. Each of you eats his own supper without waiting for each other. So one person goes hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Do you despise God's church and embarrass people who don't have anything to eat? What can I say to you? Should I praise you? I won't praise you for this. So again, getting getting at um, this idea that this is not just an individual meal, the Lord's Supper. Uh, You know, in the United States, we love our individualism, right? You know, uh, all these issues, they just have to do with me and not with you, and I can live my life completely separate from everybody else. Uh, And Paul here is saying, well, this is a a community thing, worship is. Uh, It's a community meal, the Lord's Supper is. And when we get together, we should be respecting and honoring and loving one another and not, um, you know, disrespecting people as we see in the Corinthian church. Uh, The Lord's Supper is not about gorging yourself on food, uh, it would take a lot of wafers to, to fill up your hunger, your physical hunger. Uh, it's not about getting drunk type of deal. Uh, it's really not even about the physical sustenance so much as it is about the spiritual. There's something special going on in this meal. There's something spiritual that God is giving to us. And Paul tells us, he says, after all, I passed on to you what I had received from the Lord. On the night he was betrayed, The Lord Jesus took bread and spoke a prayer of thanksgiving. He broke the bread and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he did the same with the cup. He said, this cup is the new promise made with my blood. Every time you drink from it, do it to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you tell about the Lord's death until he comes. All right. So on the the night that our Lord was betrayed, we hear that often but what does that mean? What was that night? Anyone know? It was a Passover. Yeah. The Passover feast was that night. Um, Passover was this meal that had been celebrated on and off for about 1,476 years, but who's counting, you know? Um, Passover, we read about the first one in our Exodus 12 cha- uh, passage for today. How... Uh, God's people were in slavery in Egypt. And he, through Moses, uh, told Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh refused over and over again. And so God sent these plagues. I mean business type of deal. And he keeps refusing. And God sends the tenth and most terrible plague, the plague of the firstborn, in which the angel of death was going to come and take the life of the firstborn male of every household in Egypt, Israelites included. And... If the Israelites wanted to escape this fate, what they would do is they would take a lamb uh, without defect, they would uh, slaughter it, they would put its blood on the doorposts, they would eat it as a community meal, and the angel of death would pass 
over that household. Get it? Passover. All right. We're putting it together. Um, and Jesus, he celebrates the Passover with his disciples. Uh, only this time he says, this meal is about me. He gets the bread and he says, this is my body. What in the world? Well, when we see how Jesus' life, uh, how it kind of sinks up with that of the Passover lamb, it makes sense. Because the Passover lamb for the big Jewish celebration in Jerusalem would be a year-old male without defect or, or without spots. It would be chosen from the flocks, which were kept in Bethlehem. It would be brought into Jerusalem. It would be visually inspected to make sure uh, that it was without spots or defect. And then it would be killed on Thursday uh, and its blood would be shed and the people would celebrate the meal. Well, Jesus uh, is from Bethlehem. Uh, he comes into Jerusalem on the same day that the Passover lamb is brought in. Um, as the Passover lamb is being visually inspected for spots, Jesus is being tested by the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, they're testing him to catch him in sin. And they're unable to do so, and he's found to be spotless in regard to sin. Uh, and as the Passover lamb uh, is, is being shed, that's when Jesus would be shed. You see, he celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples on that evening. And he seems to have started out this meal in, in much the same way it would normally be started out as the Passover celebration. But he gets to that part, this, this bread, this is my body. And then there's these four cups, there would have been four cups of wine at the traditional Passover meal. And the gospels seem to record Jesus lifting the first, the cup of blessing, and they omit the second one. And then they record him lifting up the third cup and saying, take and drink, this is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. He's totally redefining this meal. He's instituting something new, the Lord's Supper. He's saying that the Passover was all about him. Uh, it's an inc incredible thing. And when, when the Bible says new covenant, new promise, what it means is this. Uh, all throughout scripture, there have been covenants that God has made with his people. A covenant is an agreement, usually between a, a mighty king and a lesser uh, party in which you sort of agree to give your loyalty in exchange for protection, and if you don't follow through, you get the ax, all right? Uh, God has made plenty of covenants with his people. Uh, he made a covenant with us never to flood the earth again. He gave the rainbow. Made a covenant with Abraham. He said, I'll make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and through your descendants, all people on earth will be blessed. Uh, he made a covenant with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. If you obey my commandments, uh, then I'll be your God and you'll be blessed. Uh, only they were never too good at the actual obeying part. Um, you know, like 10 seconds later, they're worshiping a golden calf uh, and committing sexual sin. So it doesn't take long. Uh, and likewise, you and I would fail to enter heaven if it was up to the, the commandments uh, of the old covenant for us to obey. And so God, in Jeremiah, he prophesies this. This is way back. He says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new promise, new covenant to Israel and Judah. I will forgive their wickedness and I will no longer hold their sins against them. Now that's a new, different covenant that's coming. And Jesus raises that third cup and he says, uh, this is my blood of the new covenant of salvation by grace through faith, which he was about to achieve by going to the cross. And so Jesus, he, he lifts that third cup and then he gets up from the meal to go and redeem us. How many cups were there? Four. He doesn't drink the fourth cup, the cup of com completion. He only uh, sort of drinks the cup regularly when he's on the cross giving his life and he says it is finished. Because Jesus... His mission to accomplish was to redeem us from sin, which has plagued humanity, which has crushed uh, our, our planet and made it subject to uh, death. And so he brings about our redemption. And this, this Passover meal that was instituted by God uh, 1,476 years prior is, is God pointing at the fence he's going to hit the ball over. You know, It's him he's tossing up his own alley-oop alley for the dunk. Uh, it's, it's God setting up 
this meal that was going to point forward to the promised Savior so that we could identify Jesus as the one who was to come to save us from sin. And at that meal, uh, its job being done, being completed, to point forward to him, he institutes a new meal, the Lord's Supper, uh, in which we receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins, uh, the forgiveness that he won for us on the cross. Um, you know, when he says, this is my body, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins, that's a promise you can take him up on. Um, when you're at a low point, uh, when you realize you've messed up again, uh, when you've hurt that person, and, and you just feel like you've, you've made it totally hard for anyone to love you, your wor worth is way down, even when, when Satan is trying to convince you, you know what, salvation is all about doing the right things, and you haven't been doing them. Uh, and you're tempted to believe you messed up so badly, maybe God doesn't even love you anymore. It's when we're in those moments that we can come and we can receive his promise through the bread and wine, through the body and blood. Because he's promised that this is a meal for sinners who in faith approach in need of God. Uh, and when we approach in that way, we receive this amazing gift, this tangible uh, meal that God has given to us which Jesus instituted uh, and won for us on the cross. Incredible thing, right? All that from just four verses, you know, so, and we've got some more to go here. Um, 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks from the Lord's cup in an improper way will be held responsible for the Lord's body and blood. With this in mind, individuals must determine whether what they're doing is proper when they eat the bread and drink from the cup. Now, what, is, what does he mean by proper? Uh, you know, does he mean you've got to be a spiritual all-star? Uh, you know, you've got to be uh, righteous, doing everything right type of deal? Um, if he does, we're in trouble because Jesus was the only one of those uh, that, that was out there. You know, if we're holding on to this idea that by our own goodness, by our own obedience, uh, that we're going to get into heaven, we're approaching improperly. If we think God owes us one or that we'll get in because at least we're better than most people, you know, I'm better than Hitler probably, so, you know, I'll probably get in. Uh, if you're holding on to that sort of deal, uh, that ain't going to deliver you. That's approaching improperly, even unchristian. Uh, instead, we, we should approach in humility. Luther had this, this great quote. It's a little lengthy, but it's so relevant, so bear with me. For those who are wanton and dissolute must be told to stay away from the Lord's Supper. For they are not prepared to receive forgiveness of sins, since they do not desire it and do not wish to be godly. But the others, who are not such callous and wicked people and desire to be godly, must not absent themselves, even though they otherwise uh, feel feeble and full of infirmities. For we are not baptized because we are worthy and holy, nor do we go into confession because we are pure and without sin, but the contrary, because we are poor and miserable people, and just because we are unworthy. But whoever would gladly obtain grace and consolation should impel himself and allow no one to frighten him away, but say, I indeed would like to be worthy, but I come not upon any worthiness, but upon your word, God, because you have commanded it. Therefore, you have on the part of God both the command and the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he himself says, those that are whole do not need a physician, but those who are sick. That is, those who are weary and heavy laden with their sins, and with the fear of death, uh, temptations of the flesh and of the devil. If therefore you are heavy laden and feel your weakness, then go joyfully to the sacrament and obtain refreshment, consolation, and strength. For if you would wait until you are rid of such burdens that you might come to the sacrament pure and worthy, you must forever stay away. Did you guys see that Marco Rubio water sip thing? I was trying to recreate that. Um, you know, I used to go to church uh, in Austin when I went to school uh, at, at University Lutheran. Um, it was a, a great church to go and, and celebrate worship on Sunday. And I remember one Sunday in particular, um, kind of sitting uh, closer to the back and um, praying, just preparing myself to receive the Lord's Supper as, as things kind of unfolded. And... Uh, all of a sudden, my eyes kind of tracked. There was this guy up front who had stood up next to the communion rail and started uh, talking and, and stammering and getting louder and louder. And he, he kind of started yelling, and then he ran out the back of the church. And 
you know, I, I don't know what, I was just watching this unfold and he ran out and I just instinct, I'm like, I'm going to run after him, you know? I don't know what I thought I was going to do when I caught up to him. <laughs> uh, what superpower was I going to use? Who knows? Um, but I get outside and this dude, he's, he's standing on top of a bicycle that's fallen over um, and, and kind of spouting out a lot of stuff. Uh, we later found out he was bipolar off his meds. Uh, but it was interesting, he kept saying that he thought he wasn't good enough to receive the Lord's Supper, uh, to receive communion. He thought that Satan had sort of personally tormented him with his own unworthiness. Um, and what's interesting is uh, we are kind of unworthy, right? <laughs> to, to earn God's forgiveness. Uh, but it's, it's in expressing his unworthiness that he was kind of showing that he was worthy. Uh, because to be worthy to receive the Lord's Supper is to approach in faith, to recognize our, our unworthiness and recognize that it's a gift of God and, and to approach and to go, God, I desire to receive your promised forgiveness. Uh, and that's, that's how we're to, to approach uh, the Lord's Supper. You know, it says in the, in the Beatitudes, uh, Jesus said, in, I think it's Matthew 5, uh, what is it, uh, 3 or 13, one of the two, uh, where he says, uh, blessed are those who are spiritually helpless. Um, and so we recognize when we are spiritually helpless, God is strong. God gives the gift uh, of forgiveness that sustains us. Um, one church I was a part of, I, I love kind of this, this joyful celebration that they would do after communion because they realized what God had done for them. Uh, many people would kind of go down the aisle and they'd be high-fiving people on the way back, you know, uh, just kind of saying, hey, isn't it great what God has done for us today in this meal? Um, I wouldn't like bust out the t-shirt cannons or anything, but you know, it, it is an occasion to be joyful that God has forgiven our sins and remembered them no more, uh, just like he, he prophesied about in Jeremiah. Uh, he delivers that forgiveness to us in this meal. Uh, this, this is a means, uh, the, the delivery mechanism, the UPS truck uh, that God gives us so that we might receive his forgiveness. Uh, because he's, he's, he loves to give us forgiveness. He gives it to us in baptism. He gives it to us when we repent and receive absolution. He gives it to us uh, in the Lord's Supper. It's an incredible thing. Uh, Paul goes on to verse 29. He says, anyone who eats and drinks is eating and drinking a judgment against himself when he doesn't recognize the Lord's body. And there's been kind of some debate in Christendom about what does the body mean here? And we kind of fall on that side. Well, uh, he's talking about the body of the Lord that he mentioned immediately prior in context. He's talking about the body that is present in the bread on the altar. But some go, well, maybe this also means uh, the, the body of Christ, the community of believers here. And you know what, while we do need to recognize the body uh, of the Lord in the, the bread that we take in communion, we do also need to recognize the people that we're communing with. Uh, that it's not just an individual thing, it's a community thing that we need to respect and honor one another. Uh, we need to, to, to be like family, to be so close uh, that, that we, we do things together, we discuss theology together, we hang out, uh, where we help one another when we're in need. Uh, when we have problems with one another, we go to each other directly, you know, have it out and, and just kind of hug it out type of deal, you know, um, that we need to be able, uh, when we're walking up, you know, when we're, you're coming down this aisle or whatever, you know, you need to be able to kind of look around and go, you know what, we're good, we're family, we're united as, as the body of Christ. Um, that's what, what God is calling us to, that sort of uh, unity, you know. Before communion, we kind of do that thing where we greet each other uh, with God's peace. It used to be called the kiss of peace. Uh, so you'll be thankful it was changed to a handshake. Um, but the kiss of peace is still done in, in, in many cultures that do that sort of thing. Uh, it's just a way for us to, to share God's peace uh, and to honor one another who, who are present together. Um, and we do that with a handshake. We'll do it a little bit, bit later on. It's even a moment you know, albeit a brief one where we could go, you know what, I did have a problem with that person. I just need to share briefly with them uh, that all is forgiven, all is good, or that I'm sorry uh, and receive forgiveness, which was a little bit easier when Christians worshiped in, in house churches that were a little bit more flexible on the timing there, but it's still a brief moment that we have uh, to go at, we're, we're brothers and we're sisters in Christ. 
This is the reason why many of you are weak and sick and quite a number of you have died. If we were judging ourselves correctly, we would not be judged. But when the Lord judges us, he disciplines us so that we won't be condemned along with the rest of the world. So, you know, Paul goes on here, and so much for the God of law being in the Old Testament and the God of love being in the New Testament. The uh, reality is uh, God is loving and just, uh, 100% of each, uh, throughout all time. And what we have here is God dealing with sin seriously. Um, if your translation says, this is why many of you have fallen asleep, that's a little euphemism for died. This is why many of you have died. It's because in the Corinthian church, they were twisting God's gift. They were misusing it and abusing it. And so God brought about this sort of miraculous discipline, this killing. Um, and so we shouldn't need to approach the Lord's Supper in fear. But when we approach in faith, uh, we do need to remember that we have a holy God who makes us holy by the blood and, and the passion of Christ, which we saw earlier, uh, and calls us to a life of holiness in which we don't twist his gifts, which would be a barrier for people coming to know Jesus, uh, but instead we honor his gifts. He doesn't tolerate people uh, to keep others from coming to him uh, because God desires that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. All right? And then lastly, 33 and 34. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, wait for each other. Whoever is hungry should eat at home so that you don't have a gathering that brings judgment on you. I'll give directions concerning the other matters when I come. I'm like, what? Like, give the rest of the instructions here. I'd love to have them, you know? What other directions? You know, can't we just read a little bit more? We have so many questions uh, when it comes to the Lord's Supper. We're often, you know, we're asking, well, how does the body and the blood and, uh, and mesh with the bread and the wine? And, you know, uh, does it happen when I do the sign of the cross or when I read the words, what is the effective range of a communion blessing, you know? Uh, does it go across town? We have all these questions about the Lord's Supper. But the reality is we know what we need to know. God has sent his son Jesus to redeem us from sin. And he delivers his forgiveness to us in this special meal, the Lord's Supper. And when we approach in faith, we can receive his promises with joy. The supper is here, it's, it's real, it's tangible, it's for me, and it's for you to run through. Uh, and today, we'll be celebrating it. This week we'll be celebrating, same place, same time. Uh, you're invited to experience and be renewed in the forgiveness of God. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you today, Lord, for instructing us with your word. We pray, Lord, uh, that you would help um, us to not guide our lives according to what we think or any man-made doctrines, but to always go to your word for the truth. We thank you, Lord, that today, uh, as we come into your presence and worship, Lord, that you have come to us proclaiming Lord, the forgiveness of sins in your son Jesus' name. We thank you that this is a time in which you bless us with your gift of forgiveness, a time for us to honor and praise you with our, our songs, uh, with our prayers and our obedience. God, we thank you uh, and pray that as we go forward from today, Lord, that you would help us as, as we go about life to desire uh, to receive the Lord's Supper, to receive it regularly uh, for the comfort and consolation of the forgiveness of sins that you give in him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.